You made it into a QR code. You made bad apple in QR code. <laughs> Bad Apple, at its core, is two parts. One part animation, and one part music. Today, I'll only remix the visual half, because, well... The QR code generator we'll use is the one on Project Nayuki. Butchered that. It has several customization features which are required to play Bad Apple, and it comes with a detailed behind the scenes version, which will be crucial for testing. Before we can drop an Apple Core and have it turn into a woman, there are some physical limitations that need to be addressed. First, the maximum size of a QR code is the version 40 code, which has a resolution of 177 by 177 pixels. This is slightly smaller than 144p 4x3 video. This low resolution is only exaggerated by the required error correction data held on the left hand side. Next, we're going to have what are effectively dead pixels, because they're covered up by alignment markers. There's nothing I can really do about this. Alignment markers are mandatory on every code except version 1, which is pathetically small. Finally, QR codes don't have scales of grey, so all grey has to be removed from the image. You'd think that for Bad Apple, a shadow art video built upon light and dark, this would have a negligible effect. But between motion blur, flames, anti-aliasing, and shadows for the shadows that are lighter than the sh actual shadows work with, there's plenty of grey to go around. After applying all those transformations, what we're left with is approximately what we want our final code to look like. All that's left to do is to take our artificial code and scan it in reverse to give us some sort of string that'll output Bad Apple on the real deal. Simple enough, right? That said, I don't think there's any program out there that will let us accomplish this. Even if there was, I don't actively think I could find it with my mediocre at best googling skills. That leaves me with only one option. Build the program myself. Problem. I am not a computer scientist. I'm not a programmer. Fact is, I've taken approximately half a high school course on coding, and that definitely didn't teach me about image processing. To put it briefly, I have no idea what I'm doing. But there's a video to be made, so let's get on with selecting a language. I chose Python because a really old Reddit thread I saw once claiming that Python was incredibly beginner-friendly due to its large community. Any task that's remotely difficult has already been automated and put into a library, which means you don't have to do the work yourself. For my situation and purposes, that seemed good enough. Python was easy enough to install. You download it like any other application. But I would need some of those libraries previously mentioned, such as Pillow, which handles that image processing stuff that I said would be difficult earlier. And installing Pillow was not nearly as easy. Pillow is installed via a small tool called pip, which is run off the command line. I haven't really used the command line before, so I once again had no clue what I was doing. Luckily, the website gives you the exact command to enter. Unluckily, it didn't work. It kept giving me an error saying that Python wasn't installed. I don't remember how long it took, but I tried everything. From reinstalling to driver updates to computer reboots, anything I could think of. It kept returning with Python not found. Eventually, I read somewhere on Stack Overflow that the Windows 10 prefix for Python was actually just Py, not Python. And when I tried that, it worked instantly. I was so mad that I actually forgot to record the audio from almost the entire project and you can't hear my reactions. Nice! After installing Pillow, I quickly figured out how to read the color of a given pixel. I was quite pleased by this, almost to the point where I forgot it was now 1am. But upon looking at the clock, I figured I'd made enough progress and hit the hay. Honestly though, I probably should have stayed up, because I was hyper like a little kid on Christmas Eve. Reading one pixel at a time is all good and well, but it certainly won't be enough for this project. There are some 6,000 frames to do, and I'm not going to sit there entering coordinates for the next few weeks. Rather, we need an algorithm. QR codes are scanned starting in the bottom corner in a zigzag pattern that snakes through the whole image, avoiding all function modules. However, you could almost equally say that the pattern ignores function modules rather than going around. Both methods end up with the same results except for these pixels on the left. Thank goodness that's where the error correction bytes are, because I really didn't want to have to deal with those. By saying all function modules are merely ignored, some general rules can be made about the scan. All the even pixels are followed by the pixel to their left, and almost all odd pixels are followed by the pixel to their right plus or minus one on the y-axis. These general rules comprise our scan algorithm, and surprisingly, it worked on the first test. 
Uh, yeah, surprisingly, considering that the only shared feature between these two images is the little cross thing in the center. I'll explain why that is later, but it's mainly because of a faulty test. With our scan algorithm done, it would have been nice to be able to take all those ones and zeros and just plug them back into the generator. Alas, there's still more work to be done. QR codes mostly look like a garbled mess, and that's entirely intentional. The messier the pattern, the easier it is to distinguish individual pixels. To make the codes messier, one of eight mask filters is applied to the code. If we want to denoise our image, we'll have to apply the mask filter yet again. At least we can use our scanning algorithm to turn the mask into a list of bits easily combined with the list of bits from the scanner. <laughs> Even after applying the filter, this really long string can't be processed by the website. In fact, there's only four main types of data that can be turned into a QR code. These data types are numeric, alphanumeric, byte mode, and kanji. We'll have to transform our bit list into one of these four types. We can immediately rule out kanji, because I'm already using one language I don't understand, another seems ridiculous. Byte initially sounded alright, but its main drawback are the arrangements of bytes that simply can't be typed due to them corresponding to characters like null. Left with alphanumeric and numeric, I chose the latter because the way it's encoded is actually somewhat intuitive. Three digits in decimal can have 1,000 different values, and ten digits in binary have 1,024. Therefore, any three decimal digits can be converted into binary without wasting too much space. In our case, it means that almost every set of ten pixels corresponds to a three-digit number. In order to represent the patterns that have no three-digit decimal equivalent, we'll just flip the first bit, leaving the rest of it intact. That's why the test from earlier has stray pixels. And that's honestly the most complex part of the numeric encoding system. There's no tables to look up to, no IDs or indexes, it's just converting 10 bits, or if you want a truly disgusting word, decabits, <laughs> into decimal. Simple, easy, and done. Finally, these decimal numbers need to be combined into one string, and then we can finally give that to the generator. I initially tested this with a version 7 code, because it's small enough to potentially do the maths by hand on, but large enough to warrant multiple alignment markers. With version 7, my code didn't work. But with version 5, my code worked perfectly. And there it is, an image straight out of Bad Apple, at a potato resolution of 37 by 37. Sakuya Izayoi has never been seen before at such resolutions. Perhaps, if we're lucky, we may even use this to find out if she wears pants. At this point, I was given one final choice. I could stop here and make the video on the version 5 code, or I could continue on the quest for higher resolution and find out why version 6 and up still end up as garbage. I figured that if I don't use the full version 40 code, Juneferno will come around and one-up me, so let's break it down. QR codes, as it turns out, are somewhat damage resistant. These error correction bytes on the left hand side are more than just for show. In fact, they'll let you recover up to 30% of the damage done to a code. This is how you can have fancy logos in the center and still have a functioning scan. In version 6 and above, this is improved further by splitting the message into multiple blocks and interweaving them, to prevent localized damage from being too big of a deal. At this point, I was getting a little tired. I had worked on this for some two and a half days now, and I wasn't in the mood for implementing a system based on arithmetic. So at this point, I stopped using lower level codes and did all my work on the big 4.0. Version 40 itself is split into 25 blocks, the first 19 of which contain 118 bytes, the last 6 contain 119. Project Nayuki visualizes this as a table, written vertically, then horizontally, which is then red, horizontally, then vertically. Figuring out this transformation was a royal pain in my rear. I won't go into all the small details of things that went wrong or bad attempts, this script is getting really long anyways. The final algorithm for this ends up using three variables, three lists, and a spaghetti that I only know works because I tried it by hand on a smaller example. Alright, to recap, we've turned Bad Apple into a QR code lookalike. We've scanned this lookalike to get a list of over 20,000 bits. We've turned these bits into bytes so that we could shuffle them about. We've turned the shuffled stack back into bits. We've combined these new bits with the bits from a mask pattern scan. We've turned these bits into decabits, then into decimal. And we've combined these decimal numbers to get a string 7,000 characters long. After all that, does it finally work? No, of course not! Instead, this really bizarre pattern appears. I started backtracking. Step 6 on the step-by-step -step site shows you the code without a mask, so I disabled the mask combiner and took a look. Success? This is obviously flan, but it's super noisy and not just due to bad pixels. This kinda looks like the shuffler didn't work quite right, but somehow it's still mostly correct? That ended up being the first problem. The first 18 bits aren't modifiable, so my reader skips them. But those bits are part of the shuffled stack, so I used A as a placeholder. 
I happen to put all these A's at the beginning, but that's not where they're supposed to be in reality. Much better. There's still all the bad pixels around because 10 black pixels corresponds to 1023, a four digit number, but it looks much, much cleaner now. However, if we re-enable the mask filter, it's still totally wrong. Somehow, something is messed up with the mask pattern scan. Perhaps some sort of compatibility issue with the byte shuffler? I don't really know. Listen, <laughs> shuffling the bytes into the right order took all nine of my brain cells to accomplish, and now I had to mess with it again? I rescanned the mask pattern, this time including the shuffle, and pasted that in. It was obviously not going to work, but I thought it could help me determine exactly what calculations I needed to fix. And then... This is probably not gonna work. YES! That's actually... YES! Though at the time, I didn't know why, it's clear to me now what just happened. The way we've obtained the mask pattern was always just scanning a QR code full of zeros, which is effectively blank. But never before did we account for the shuffle undergone to this pattern. By adding the shuffle to the mask pattern scan, we undo everything a QR code does to scramble the output. And with that, we get exactly what we want. Bad Apple on a QR code. Now let's do that with the other 6,000 frames. Pillow has some GIF processing, but I couldn't figure out how it worked. Luckily, there was another solution that I was far more accustomed to. All we have to do is record our actions and repeat for 6,000 fi- Oh. Uh, it seems to be a running theme that everything involved with my Bad Apple videos is from at least five years ago, including Mouse Recorder. I searched for the updated version, which doesn't seem to have a cap on the maximum number of loops. So, all we have to do is record our actions and repeat for the next si- Seriously? All right, scuffed solution incoming. The macro is seven repetitions itself, which repeats for another 939 times, totaling to 6,573 total repetitions. And that's exactly what I did. For obvious reasons, the video is sped up and observant viewers will notice that the real render took about an hour and a half. Even more observant viewers will also find that this footage is actually from weeks ago and it totally could have been used to fix the recent upload drought I've had. But in my defense, I have a really good reason for not uploading it. It's because I... I lost my account password. Uh, yep. Excluding background research I did months ago, this project took around four days. Thank you for watching the video all the way up to this point. I know that this video is the longest one I've ever made, and the fact that you're still here is really cool. If you enjoyed the video, please let me know, and if you'd like to see more like this, consider checking out my other videos and maybe even subscribing. I've left links to some of the resources that helped me through this project in the description. And that's about it. See ya! <laughs> you know, I'm normally a gaming channel. <laughs>